So today I will tell you a bit about uh, Clarin, about uh, the what is what is in there actually in the infrastructure. Um, lots of the slides are actually coming from Dieter, who is the director, uh, technical logical director from Clarin, but uh, he had a child last week, so he, he can't be here today. So I will tell you a bit about uh, what we have in Clarin. Um, so what is Clarin? It's the Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure, and it is a research infrastructure for the humanities and social sciences. You heard already uh, from Francisca. Uh, it provides easy and sustainable access for schoolers, both to uh, digital language data in many modalities, uh, but also to advanced tools to do something with them, to uh, either discover this data, so resource discovery is very important, but also then to, to work with it, uh, to annotate it, to analyze it. So what we already heard, what would be nice to do actually with uh, newspaper articles and so on. Um, so the Clarion infrastructure centers around, uh, 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 is a distributed architecture where uh, Clarion centers play an important role. Um, and uh, these Clarion centers, they are like the nodes in the network and they provide the data, the services, the applications, and they do that over the web in uh, general. And they give these services to the researcher. Um, it's a European uh, research infrastructure, so it has been on the S3 uh, roadmap for a long time and it was one of the first or second ERIC to be established. And this year they got the landmark status, which means that uh, they are doing well. Um, and here you see the list of the members. What do the countries get for this? So um, if you are a member, the benefits are that you have access to the Clarion infrastructure. So you have access to all these Clarion language resources and technology services. You have access to the expertise. So there's a lot throughout the year, a lot of knowledge in Clarion about uh, knowledge sharing, about, uh, about using these kind of resources, what are the resources around, what services are there. Um, uh, there is embedding in the humanities uh, research community, so there are contact with uh, various research communities. And you can make your uh, resources visible uh, by the Clarion, and also the researchers results on them, uh, but also your, lots of time these resources are also a form of cultural heritage, so they are also visible there. And they provide opportunities for cross-lingual and cultural research. And for that nowadays, Clarin uh, also participates in a European um, uh, research projects, and then Clarin countries and centers in themselves can be part of these projects as well. So there are now uh, 34 uh, clearance centers, so even one in the States. So in, uh, there's a B center there, which means that they <coughs> actually provide data and services. Uh, there's also various C centers, so Clarence has these several types of centers, and certainly the B centers are uh, the most prominent ones at the moment. But if you are a C center, you're also providing data and uh, metadata to the infrastructure. So let's have a look at what the services are uh, for researchers which are available at the moment. So these are really services you can use now already. Um, well, they are available on this list, but we'll go over them uh, one by one. Um, and behind these, there are lots of more technical services that you don't have to see, but uh, that are important if you are a clearance center or if you're providing data, data and metadata to the Clarion infrastructure. So there are deposition and archiving <coughs> services. These are mainly coming from specific centers. So there are centers who have archives and you can deposit your data there depending on what is kind of the, the archive policy or uh, the scope of the archive. There are also several archives who are general in nature and um, they are open for depositing. So um, if you have valuable data sets, you can provide metadata to it. You can store these in these kind of archives. And then they will be vis become visible in the Clarion infrastructure. And if they are in these kind of archives, then the 
the metadata information about these raw sources becomes available in what we call the virtual language observatory, which is like the central Clarin uh, catalog, from which I have here a screenshot. Um, so we, you can search for that. That is basically a metadata search. So I search for newspaper, and you see you will get various matches, but not only on, on uh, the full text search, there are also all kinds of uh, uh, facets there, so like language or collection titles or um, uh, how is it with access rights. All of this information is available and in general you can jump from an entry in there directly to the landing page to the uh, archive that provides this data. So this is a good tool for uh, resource discovery. But this is basically mostly on the metadata level but there is also a tool that goes deeper into the actual data, which is the federated content search. This actually relies on that several of the archives, sometimes uh, corpora mainly, they have really specific uh, content search engines. And using federated content search, you can actually go in. So again, I search for newspaper and then it will go and find in various collections uh, matches. So behind the hood, this is like an aggregator. So behind the scenes, all these various search engines are contacted and you can actually see matches in there and you get a keyword in context uh, uh, return overview of, of matches. Then there are various web services and applications which are available. Uh, for example, in uh, Germany, you have the Weblicht and which are actually you allow you to chain various web services together to do a certain task and they are available also in, the, in various languages for in the Netherlands there is a different web service architecture but there are sets of these kind of web services of course sometimes resources are protected because they have IPR issues for example the Royal Library uh, has things that are only available to researchers so it would be very nice if you are able to access these resources just with your institute's uh, credentials and that is what uh, uh, is done using these identity providers and the service providers. So there is a kind of trust domain between them um, which is the federation <coughs> and uh, the clearance centers cooperate in this federation and they cooperate uh, also with national uh, 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 federations would make it easy for you to just use your uh, credentials to get to, to all the protected resources in there, if you are allowed to access them. Then if you find all kinds of resources that you find are interesting, you can combine them, keep the links to them in your own virtual collections. So you can go out there using the VLO or other ways to find certain resources and then collect them together in these kind of virtual collections. So they can be pointers to resources from various archives or um, uh, centers. So this is an example, absolute spatial dikesis and proto toponyms in Kata Kolok. Well, I don't know, somebody from the Max Planck Institute who, who created this uh, uh, collection. And here there are several resources that she uh, put together. And this thing is then, this collection is available again and you can direct other people uh, to your resource, to this resource. So it also get a persistent identifier so you can actually um, refer to this uh, as a static uh, set. Also Clarin is able uh, to provide <coughs> consultancy. What should you do? How can you handle your data? What kind of services are there? There are um, you can get into get into contact with us we can provide you information of the services that are available so this is based on a set of uh, uh, technological pillars from clarin which is this federated identity that's what i just talked about so you can log in use to in with your institutional username and password and the whole machinery behind that that you hopefully don't have to see much from um, it's called federated identity. Uh, there are persistent identifiers, so uh, that provides you with uh, sustainable citations of electronic resources. So the, the 
idea is there that in 10 times from 10 years from now you would still be able to actually access the resources um, even if they have moved um, uh, physically or digitally um, sustainable repositories so repositories that are stable that have certain uh, quality stamp uh, and that's why they are the B centers for example they have a certification process so they get a certified B center which means that they are stable and uh, they have policies that help in the sustainability of the repositories there is a flexible metadata that means it's not a a fixed scheme there's a lot of flexibility there and it means that we can do a very dedicated metadata description of specific language resources so not everything has to fit a very uh, tight scheme but it can be really tailored to um, 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 to a specific type of resources but by using concept definitions and semantic interoperability we can do these general services like the, the virtual language observatory that I showed which can then still work on these very flexible uh, metadata schemes. Where possible, we use a well-described and open uh, protocol. So for example, in this uh, content search, so um, search engines that are hooking into the federated content search of Clarin, uh, they uh, are using this uh, protocol. And um, yeah, the same is happening, should be happening with the web service chaining. Um, it's also an area where in Clarin Plus still a lot of work is going on. So that allows users to tie together uh, uh, language processing services. So centers and services in Clarin are not <coughs> only islands, they are not only there for their center, they are really well connected using this central service which is the center registry which actually provides what the information on what are the endpoints at the various services uh, which can be monitored and, and uh, they provide the information to the central services which can then access these local services. So it means that using the, the central clearance services you can access a lot of local services. Well, this, this goes on with a bit of the integration. So, um, uh, for example, for web services. So, Elon is a, is a tool for um, annotating uh, time media. So, it's basically a, a, a desktop tool. But from there, you can actually call Weblicht, which is a web services chaining engine, uh, which uh, you can use to do tagging. And then next, one of the other services you could tol call is from another center, which is... Uh, uh, the Bavarian, Bavarian speak, speech archive, which have web mouse, which can do phonetic alignment. So you can have several steps that actually run uh, services on different centers, access them still from your own uh, local environment. And the language resource switchboard, that is another project that is currently going on within Clarin, which is also part of the Clarin Plus uh, project. It's would, it is basically also it enables you to take a resource that you found in, the, in the, the virtual language observatory and then ask what are the tools that are able to process this resource. And then it will take you actually to this uh, um, uh, web services or web interface and help you in uh, executing this task that you would like to do with the data. Another level of integration is where is Clarin positioned in, in the, uh, the whole do area of, of infrastructures? So in Europe there is a huge, basically a stack of uh, cooperation and um, 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 yeah, various levels of infrastructure. And for example, these identity federations, they are on this low level, in, uh, which uh, Jean is dealing with. Then we have the big data centers uh, which are working together in UDOT and Clarin works together with them again to build up a specific research infrastructure for language resources for social sciences and uh, humanities and of course on top of that we have the users or the researchers that actually can then use these 
very much more specific uh, surfaces that Clarin opens up to them. In between here, there is something in the middle, which is the Research Data Alliance, which, um, which uh, helps in, in coordinating and, and making standards and talking about good and best practices for these kind of uh, central surfaces that span over, um, over uh, yeah, research communities. So, um, well, Clarin is not a static infrastructure, uh, so we need to develop and more and more services and also more data will come available. So, a workshop like this and also like the, the, the one on oral history, but also this one now on the newspapers is an excellent opportunity for Clarin to hear about the needs, what would be needed, uh, what are your experiences with tools, what would be a more would be very valuable as a more general tool? Um, uh, can you already find all the resources that you need? Um, are they good visible in our current infrastructure? And um, maybe we have to create additional bridges between the, the infrastructure and the and the researchers and the data and service providers. Um, yeah, I did already a, a search on uh, collections of newspapers in, in what we have in the currently, and the you, you, you see some entries there already, but of course there are more out there. Uh, and of course we, it would be great if we could, if you can find all of them in the virtual language observatory. Um, that means gathering the metadata so they become visible there. It gets a bit technical maybe, but if there are any people who would like to offer their, uh, uh, their collections and make them visible in the VLO, these would be the steps. Um, we need at least to have the Dublin Core metadata, but it could be also more dedicated uh, metadata profile using uh, CMDI, which is our uh, flexible metadata scheme. And then at that moment, when that is available, we can actually harvest and get access uh, to to um, to the metadata and make it visible in the in the VLO. Um, if you have non-digitized resources, they can still be there. They can still uh, become visible to the user, and then you at least have to provide information on how they could get into contact and how they could go and actually visit the more uh, physical resource. Um, if you have access restrictions then also the metadata should contain information about how you can obtain access, what are the, why is it restricted, um, is it okay if you're just an academic, so, or do I really need to get personal access to, um, to the data? And uh, for that, of course, it would be good if then the, the single sign-on, <laughs> the identity federation is actually used um, uh, by the, the the archive that is hosting the data because then the user can actually come in uh, using his own credentials. And another way, even a step further, is if the, the, uh, the, the newspaper collection already has a content search engine, it could potentially be integrated into the federated content search. So, we are, uh, the most important to us is, is to get feedback from you what are your ideas? What are your suggestions? What do you lack? Uh, so any feedback would be uh, is highly appreciated. So thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions that I can answer already, then uh, I would like to. A few shorter questions. A few shorter questions. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, this is a question about how it actually, yeah, how it is that you facilitate or try to facilitate uh, the interoperability. So, say you're working with different digitized archives. Yeah. But those archives have, yeah, different ways of searching their material, right? So some you can search with OCR and some you can't, and some you can search OCR but only on like a full newspaper page. So you cannot find co-occurrences within an article. So if you're trying to make a comparison then between like going through Clarin uh, to compare those three archives or material from those archives, 
like how is it that you, yeah, sort of enhance the interoperability? Yeah, there, there, that's a different, uh, yeah. If you're talking just about the metadata level, then you would like to know if I search, where do I end up? Will I end up in, in, an, in an, um, um, a specific article or newspaper or on the collection level? These are um, currently in, in Clarion, that is a bit of a mixed bag. Sometimes people just have one metadata record for a whole collection. Sometimes we have very much more detailed info information on a resource. But we, if there are, is like a, a tree where um, from resource you can actually walk up to the, uh, the collection level in the metadata. So that is possible using this uh, <coughs> SIMD uh, infrastructure. Then we can actually indicate that so you can see where you end up there. In if you're talking about really do an actual keyword search, um, what happens now is that you Where was the search? You end up here. Uh, no, this was not the one. This one. So based on these different responses you get, they might be on different levels then. And uh, what, what happens now is that um, the, all these endpoints basically describe what they can, uh, how they support the general model of the FCS, so of, of the federated content search. But if they are more powerful or they can provide more information like doing the search in OCR or uh, different levels, then they are encouraged to, to point you on to the actual search engine within the... So it's, it helps more in resource discovery than, than this is directly the whole tool for uh, well, to do your actual research in order to prove your hypothesis. So it's still more on the resource discovery level. I would say. One more short question and the rest for the break and later on. Someone with a short question? Here. What can become available for someone outside the Clarion network, whether it is just in the meantime outside or yeah, um, remain outside? Still quite a lot, because if you're, you're not in a center or in a country that is part of the federation, you can still uh, register with Clarion yourself, and then you get a Clarion account, so then it's still not it's not your, uh, your institute's credentials anymore, but there is actually a process that will check if you are a researcher. So there is some manual validation there, and then you will have an account which enables you to actually access the Clarin uh, resources and facilities.